Great. Thank you very much, Jim. And uh, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to speak to you today about paleoclimatology, uh, the study of climate, its lessons, and uh, what we really should learn from the real earth science history and data. In very recent geologic history, Canada and Ireland have suffered from a common fate. We have been completely covered by glacial ice sheets. Repeatedly, very thick and extensive ice sheets have completely covered our two countries. What did we do to deserve this sort of treatment? This talk is going to introduce a lot of material. Uh, note that our emphasis will be on the data and on the earth science record. More detailed information contained in three videos that we've produced will be linked at the last part of the talk. We'll be talking about climate change, not weather. We are talking about long-term variations over large areas of the Earth. The Earth's climate is driven, of course, by the sun. We will review how the Milankovitch cycle variations in orbital parameters affect the incoming solar energy. We'll examine how energy is stored and accumulated. Now that's a really important part that is missing from everything else that we've reviewed. This is the one key ingredient that we feel is missing from climate studies. The movement of stored energy around the earth by ocean currents is essential. We'll learn how these transporters and accumulators of energy have changed over time as a direct result of continental drift. This component is also very sadly missing from any existing climate studies. We will not just be dealing with the past 200 years. We will extend our knowledge and our data back to times before the dinosaurs became extinct. 67 million, million years ago is where we'll start. We didn't have any scientists taking measurements thousands of years ago, so we'll use foxy, proxy fossils, sorry, fossil proxies. Uh, these uh, fossil proxies are like isotopes, uh, for example, and uh, prove compelling evidence uh, that is much more reliable than unproven theories. This presentation will review ancient fossil data from experiments that this has conducted on itself many, many times. This data is our Earth climate memory, encased in the layers of rock and ice history. By examining the past, we will learn more about the present and be better equipped to forecast the future. This chart plots historical temperature of the Earth using a proxy. Note that the horizontal time axis is compressed and has several time scale changes. The present day is on the right, very much expanded. And half a million years ago, sorry, 500 million years ago is on the left side. 18 degrees Celsius change in temperature is illustrated on the vertical axis. Also note the green Eocene, E arrow, as a reference point for later, at 50 to 60 million years ago, just after the dinosaurs went extinct. Note, there has been a significant temperature reduction since the Eocene. This temperature record is developed from oxygen isotopic ratios in fossils, sediments, and ice. Over the last 50 million years, the temperature of the world has plunged, leaving the world in a glacial period today, the black Pleistocene P arrow. The past 11,000 years are known as the Holocene, during which the Earth's temperature has been relatively steady. We are living during a rare time on an isolated island of warming during a period of extreme pulsating glaciation. Here's an even further look back in time to 4.6 billion years ago. The plot uses proxies of both temperature in blue and atmospheric carbon dioxide in purple. Note the strong lack of correlation through time between temperature and CO2. This history is very inconsistent with current global warming theory. We will focus on this discrepancy very soon using solid long-term data, not theory. The Eocene, E, the arrow, 
is again shown. And perhaps uh, there is some relationship that you might be able to see between temperature and CO2 after the Eocene, but is that really the case? Please note that the high CO2 coupled with lower temperatures are strangely the rule, not the exception, since the formation of the Earth. And this is in direct contrast to popular climate theory. The arrows show three periods of Earth history, the Cretaceous K, the E, Eocene, and P, Pleistocene, for reference later. How has sea level varied through these same time periods? Three major glacial periods before our current Pleistocene have existed. Lower sea levels generally correspond to these glaciations. Extreme sea level variations do occur. This chart shows over 100 meter of range of those sea levels. We will look at sea level again later in the talk. The model modern rate of sea level changes is much more gradual than in the past as shown here. Now let's focus on a period of time that spans between the death of the dinosaurs, once again, 65 million years ago and today. The graph, the green line, shows a total temperature fall of about 18 degrees Celsius during this period. This temperature fall is documented using, once again, fossil, isotopic, and ice core information. Note again, some critical time periods, K, E, O, M, and P. We will address this relationship of temperature and the polar ice that's mentioned on this slide a little bit later. The important take home from this graph is the dramatic global temperature decline that the world is caught up in. This slide shows the same time interval back 65 million years and the slide, the former green line has now been colored red for the warmer portion and blue for the colder. Please note the heavy blue line in the top right side of the graphic box. This blue line represents the southern polar glaciations on the globe. They are coincident with dropping temperatures over time. South polar eastern Antarctic glaciation began 34 million years ago at an abrupt change in temperature shown by the yellow arrow, the Oligocene. A major, sorry, <laughs> a minor warming followed this and uh, culminated near the M Miocene, um, the blue arrow 14 million years ago. After this, a rapid and enduring fall in temperature led to the formation of the, the Western Antarctic ice sheets. There's still no glaci uh, glaciation on Greenland. There's no Northern ice cap at this point uh, until the Black Arrow P. Northern glacial ice finally formed coincident with a strong accelerating fall in global temperature. We are living at a time shown in the lower right corner of this chart, 16 to 18 degrees below the Eocene peaks. What has caused this dramatic temperature decline in glaciation? The answer to this question comes from looking at the largest fundamental factors in Earth climate and their changes through this long history. Solar, ocean energy storage, accumulation, and ocean currents, all modified by continental drift positions. Solar, the sun. There's no other significant source of energy to drive the climate system of Earth. The oceans provide the best long-term accumulation and storage of sol solar energy. This is a fantastic energy absorber. It's a cumulative circulating collector of solar energy over long time periods. Energy is collected and transported in the ocean currents around the earth. And these thermal currents of energy have varied over time and have a very unique history, which of course we will be tracking. In stark contrast, the atmosphere is not a place for long-term climatic energy storage or accumulation. In the atmosphere, the water systems again will dominate and they'll move their energy back to the ocean or it will be radiated to space. Oceans represent 71% of the Earth's surface. Oceans have a very low albedo, which means that they are excellent absorbers of the sun's energy. Oceans are the best solar energy absorbers of all the natural Earth's surfaces. 
in our climate system, we only have water existing in, in uh, we have water existing in three phases at normal earth temperatures and pressures. Um, as water changes between those phases, energy is absorbed or releases as latent heat. Water has a very high specific heat capacity to retain solar energy. Unlike water, carbon dioxide exists only as a gas in our climate system. It does not undergo phase changes and is a poor, very short-term retainer of energy. Water absorbs and releases latent heat as shown in this diagram as it goes through its phase changes. This is why water storage and accumulation dominates and needs to be much more carefully looked at in all of the climate concepts. The currents of the ocean are the largest energy transporting systems on the earth. As the continents have drifted due to tectonic plate motion, oceanic passages between continents have opened or closed. This continental plate motion has resulted in significant changes in the Earth's network of ocean currents. These changes to the energy distribution system have created major historic climatic variations. Some changes have promoted climate optima, while others have resulted in cold glacial times. Over 200 million years ago, the Earth had a single supercontinent. It was called Pangaea. About 175 million years ago, Pangaea began to break up as the underlying tectonic plates split and moved. As these pieces drifted away from each other, they began to form continents in the shape that we recognize today. We will trace their movement from about 66 million years ago. At 66 million years ago, it was during the late Cretaceous K, just before the dinosaurs went extinct. There was a completely open equatorial seaway that allowed the oceanic currents to circulate freely around the warmest part of the earth, circulating and distributing solar energy and influencing climate. Temperatures were high, water levels were high. No ice caps existed, life was abundant. In the Eocene, E, at about 56 million years ago, Following the death of the dinosaurs, this equatorial seaway remained open to strong warm currents. These currents allowed cumulative oceanic solar energy to accumulate and be stored. India, note, is moving northward. In the Southern Hemisphere, the Drake Passage is closed and the Tasman Strait is still closed. Australia and South America are firmly joined to Antarctica. At the North Pole, the Arctic was closed and contained a large freshwater lake. There were no polar ice caps on either pole. Here's that equatorial current uh, simplified a little bit so you can see more clearly where it's going. It's the cumulative energy collection of this in storage and then the warming uh, up by these um, areas of equatorial currents that occurred at an optimum at this time, the global temperatures were 16 to 18 degrees Celsius above today. Biological blooms due to upwelling ocean currents occurred. This was an uninterrupted, completely uninterrupted by any land, El Nino on steroids with open equatorial warm water circulation, collection, energy, and heat over time. This condition was long-term climate altering, warm and positive for biological growth. In the Oligocene, about 34 million years ago, major plate movements, collisions and changes occurred. Temperatures remained warm until seaway openings occurred at both the poles and some closing of the equatorial seaways was partially accomplished. India was colliding with Asia and partly closing the Tethys Seaway. The, the Arctic Ocean was open and the Drake and Tasman passages were open. This allowed the cold circumpolar currents to dominate and isolate the South Pole. What happened then was the Southeastern Antarctic ice sheets began to form. In the mid Miocene, 14 million years ago, M in this case, 
the Panamanian passage narrowed between the Atlantic and the Pacific and the Indonesian Australian areas narrowed, changing the connection between the Indian and the Pacific oceans. The conveyor that we looked at a little earlier uh, and the collector of warm equatorial waters was beginning to be shut down. The isolation of Antarctica by the circumpolar currents became stronger as the Southern Ocean widened. As a result, Southern polar ice caps now expanded into Western Antarctica. No polar ice caps have yet formed in the North. Finally, 3.3 million years ago, Panama and Indonesia closed and terminated the equatorial ocean current conveyor and accumulator energy. The world's currents were now forced into a north-south pattern. North and south ice caps expanded and also sea ice sheets formed in the south, especially. Large 41,000 and 100,000 year long glacial cycles began. Drastic 10 degrees centigrade cooling swung between top and bottom and were driven by the Milankovitch cycles, which we'll discuss soon. The world spends most of its time as glacial, cold, dry, and notably very dusty. The closure of the Isthmus of Panama is well documented, and I could go through each one of these closings and openings in this way. This one uh, was very important to the current period, so we've stressed it. The fossil changes in the chemistry changes across between the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean document this. The migration of animals across the land bridge document the timing of this closing. The large gap that once existed and allowed the equatorial currents to flow was rerouted from east-west to north-south. A similar closing occurred between Australia and Indonesia at this time and terminated another significant part of the former equatorial currents. The global climate abruptly changed and began to cool. This is what temperature has done over the last five million years. Panama closes and sends the earth into the Pleistocene ice ages, further reducing oceanic energy storage. Large glacial and interglacial periods bounce up and down in an overall declining temperature system. Solar cycles of the sun earth system become very evident as you see on this slide with 41,000 year earlier and 100,000 year later periodicity to these glaciations, these spikes. Note how global temperature continues, however, to fall. The Pleistocene has arrived. This is a time of extreme adaptation and change for the world. This is a condition that we now somehow deem in our wisdom to be normal. The information presented so far is derived from a variety of proxy data, isotopes being shown here. The understanding of continental drift has enabled us to analyze the most significant factors at work and compile them into real global time related stories. Fortunately, in 2020, a new source of excellent proxy data became available that covers the past 67 million years with a very high sample density and accuracy. It is based on isotopic analysis of microscopic fossil benthic forams, which have been recovered from deep sea cores over many, many years from multiple drill sites all around the world. This compilation by 20 authors under Westerhold of Germany depicts the full 67 million years in great detail. The data is shown and is known as the Sinograd. The shells of these microscopic fossils were sampled. The analysis was conducted on their carbon and their isotopes of oxygen as well to arrive at some startling conclusions. The ratio of 18 to 16 oxygen isotopes is affected by temperature and the ratio of carbon 13 to 12 is indicative of carbon dioxide concentration. Here's the plot of the oxygen 18 to 16. This ratio is a proxy of temperature. 
the error bars or bands are indicated in blue. The red line is the best fit of that data. The total equivalent temperature range, once again, about 18 degrees C. For reference, E, O, and M, and P times are shown, as referred to earlier, to help us with our description that we just went through of the continental drift maps. Here we have added a plot of the carbon 13 to 12 ratios, all isotopes, of course, again, from the same shell samples. This ratio is a proxy for carbon dioxide concentration. Please note how carbon dioxide and temperature do not correspond or move together consistently in this data. Alarm bells should be going off. Perhaps there are other controlling factors that need to be considered. Major volcanic events are shown as orange triangles, significantly large injections of CO2 by volcanic activity into the atmosphere do not have the predicted temperature effect the current theory might suggest. To try to analyze what is going on, um, Westerhold et al. used a modern tool known as a recurrence analysis plot and applied it to their data. These recurrence plots allow our eyes to see the pattern of temperature on the right versus CO2 concentration on the left. The pattern of the two plots, if you look at them closely, definitely do not show components of symmetry. Popular theories would say that the two plots should correspond and mimic each other. They do not. We conclude that temperature and CO2 are independent of each other and do not co-vary. However, these data sets do share some common times of change the small black arrows that you might be able to see on there with numbers beside them. They're all coincident with major continental drift events in geologic time. In the 1920s, Milankovitch theorized the cyclic variations in the orbital parameters of the Earth as it moves around the sun would affect the magnitude of solar radiation that strikes the Earth and thus create climate variation. There are three major Milankovitch cycles. These have periodicities of 24, 41, and 100,000 years. These Milankovitch cycles are due to cyclic variations in the eccentricity, the distance between the sun and the earth, axial tilt or obliquity of the earth, and the precession or wobble of the earth's axis. These cycles combine their wavelengths combine constructively or destructively to alter the resulting solar radiation striking the Earth's surface. Westerhold et al. saw a pattern in their data and investigated using Fourier analysis. This performed on time varying data to look for repeated cyclic patterns, much like seismic uh, would be done in geology. They're all done within the frequency domain. This FFT analysis, hard to look at in this slide, I'm sorry, is all based on the fossil isotopic data and creates a spectrogram of repeated cycles buried in the data. This frequency analysis independently reproduced the Milankovitch cycles of the Earth-Sun system. So the data generated it, not the theory. They also found that they had 405,000 and 100,000 year frequency cycles in the early parts. And in the later parts, they saw, saw 41,000 and 24,000 year cycles starting to show up more and more. Near the modern glacial times, the 100,000 year pulse, the eccentricity begins to dominate as it does in ice core. This analysis seems to be the heartbeat of the solar earth, it is the Milankovitch cycles, the real foundational energy driver of the earth climate system, especially at this very sensitive end when heat is diminishing. Shortly after Westerhold et al. published their paper, Essenbach took the same Sinograd data and replotted it in a format that is much more usable for studying the earth's past climate. 
he plotted the temperature on the vertical axis and the carbon dioxide concentration on the horizontal axis. Hotter reds are up and colder blues are down in this illustration. CO2 is plotted on the horizontal axis, increasing logarithmically to the right. Between 180 ppm on the left and 2000 ppm on the right. The data covers time from 67 million years ago to about the latest glacial maximum, LGM. The colored continuous line drawn through the data points is the trace of time moving through the chart. So we start on the left upper. Your con our contribution to this plot will be to show the continental drift timing that is evident in this data. As we now see, there are large steps in the temperature between openings and closings of ocean current seaways. Note the K, E, O, M, and P represent the geologic ages from our continental drift maps, corresponding to times of change between continental movements and significant openings and closings of those seaways. Let's follow this colored line through time. First, there's the step of temperature, which started 67 million years ago, the late Cretaceous. During this period, the CO2 concentration varied by a factor of more than two, with only minor variations in temperature, a rather flat profile or what we'll call a temperature step. This is then followed by the Eocene, E in time, the time of open equatorial seaways we talked about and thermal energy collection and storage that dominated a very warm earth time. The temperature remained very consistent despite CO2 concentration more than tripling. This does not fit greenhouse gas theory. The Eocene is another step in a relatively constant temperature irrespective of CO2 moving between 600 and 2000 parts per million. Temperature did not move with CO2. This was then followed between 47 and 34 million years ago where CO2 concentration was relatively high and steady, but the temperature dropped by almost five degrees. CO2 and temperature do not match again. Rather, the oceanic heat engine is being shut down. The Southern Ocean current system is opening. Then the Oligocene, the light blue line segment, a long even temperature step where the CO2 concentration varied by almost three times with no corresponding increase in temperature. This condition lasted for 20 million years. This CO2 temperature mismatch suggests even more problems with theory. Glacial ice caps continued to form on Eastern and Antarctica. It became isolated from the equator by those polar currents. And the Tasman and Drake passages continued to open up. Then another temperature drop of about four degrees in the M Miocene, even though the CO2 concentration was fairly constant temperature and CO2 actually began to move in opposite directions to what the theory would suggest over 10 million years. The drifting continents then shifted again at 3.3 million years, culminating in the ice house of the Pleistocene after Panama and Indonesia, Australia closed. The CO2 concentration dropped by 35%, the temperature dropped by four degrees C the continents had moved to block the equatorial heat accumulation and plunged the earth into repeated glaciations driven, as we saw, by the Milankovitch Earth-Sun cycles. Ice caps flourished at both North and South Poles during Milankovitch extremes. At the present time, we are still in that ice house. We will look at our current interglacial warm period now, the Holocene, soon for greater understanding of this unique time. So in summary, 
There are distinct steps of constant temperature that correspond to times between major openings and closings of ocean current seaways. CO2 and temperature do not correlate through this long time series data. Each temperature step can be represented by any PPM number, high or low, in the readings of CO2. Climate CO2 theory and the IPCC's work cannot therefore accurately guess what the temperature related to a specific CO2 reading might be. They are drawing a straight line through time and many geologic events between very convenient end members. Let's look at the recent glacial ice history. This will help us to understand the conditions after Panama and Indo-Australia closed and narrowed. In this ice core data, we see the most recent 100,000 year Milankovitch cycles of glaciation and the minor spikes of warmth in between them. The latest glacial maximum, LGM, is marked. The proxy of temperature is shown in blue, controlled by the Milankovitch. The CO2 concentration is in green. CO2 follows ocean heating and cooling in this data. A seldom mentioned dust curve. I want to draw your attention to at the bottom. It's shown in red. That dust came from the deserts of the cold, dry world. It was left bare of vegetation during the depths of the glaciations. Worldwide dust storms were prevalent during glacial maxima. How much solar energy does it take to extract the world from a full-on ice age? Cumulative combined Milankovitch solar energy cycles are shown in blue above. For reference, the 100,000 watts per meter squared arrow on the left is the solar radiation difference between today's summer and winter in the Northern Hemisphere. The tilt, of course, causing that. Milankovitch cycles show about the same variation, about 100 watts per meter squared. Notice how blue solar cycles attempt multiple tries to extract the world from the age. They only succeed when all the cycles combine constructively together with the ice albedo changes, which I'm suggesting were due to dust accumulation. This escape from the ice age is called the termination. On average, termination took 6,000 years to melt out at the end of the last nine major glaciations, as shown here. Polar power, orbital timing, dust albedo changes all appear to have combined to raise the temperature of the world by 10 degrees or more and melt the ice of the world's ice caps and sea ice to leave us in the Holocene warm period today. Over the past 20,000 years, since that latest glacial maximum, the LGM, the sea levels have been rising at 40 to 60 millimeters per year in pulses, unsurprisingly. But it has slowed to only 1 20th or less of that rate over the past few thousand years of the Holocene. Let's focus on the Holocene, the period that we're living in, that small little island of warmth between the glaciations. This graph shows the last 11,000 years of Earth's temperature in black, the atmospheric CO2 concentration in red, and the pre-industrial time that we're involved in here. Note that the CO2 is rising during to and during, sorry, a cooling period of the Holocene. Very important to note that. Note that the hottest times show the lowest CO2. The complete inverse of what greenhouse gas theory has been preaching. The total temperature is um, falling, um, as you see, and it's following something which is that purple arc, the Earth's obliquity. That would be the tilt of the Earth's axis. It's not following the CO2 in any way. The Holocene can be divided into two parts, an early higher temperature part, the thermal maximum, of the top map and the neoglacial half that we are living in now, the lower map. 
humid and wet areas of the upper map have been replaced completely by dry desert like neo glacial conditions now. We are living in the neo glacial. We are not at the peak of the Holocene's temperature that was 8,000 years ago. The latter Holocene is the time of man's civilized history. Shown in the green vertical stripes, we thrive in the warm times and we suffered in the cold times. Note that the temperature fell over the entire Holocene time frame. The little ice age shown in blue is recorded worldwide in alpine ice fields. CO2 and temperature moved in opposite directions. CO2 rose as temperature fell, not as theory would suggest. What about the rates of warming during the Holocene? This is not that long ago. Note the sharp jumps of temperature between 1.5 and 3 degrees centigrade. These were times long before any modern modification of the atmosphere. Note how abruptly the black lines of warming, going up, up arrows, give way to the purple cooling trend lines, down arrows. The natural Holocene is loaded with abrupt temperature changes. And please note that the slopes of many of those changes are very close to one another. By taking those slopes of warming from the previous ice core graphic and converting them to numbers, we get the rate of change of the Holocene warming temperatures as shown in this plot. The current warming period is on the right-hand end of the graph. The older, warmer periods are on the left. The older Holocene showed much faster rates of warming than now. The last 11,000 years has seen times of much stronger rates of warming than we are currently experiencing. Turning briefly to the very short term, which I promised not to go to, but we're going to do that anyway. The past few hundred years, the primary influencers of climate are still here. They influence our weather and our climate both. They're the solar cycles, the oceanic currents, the oceanic circulation and oscillations, the regional oceanic energy conditions that drive the long-term climatic variations. Recent solar activity does correlate to recent temperature and climate history. As seen here, when solar activity was low, in, it co coincided with the cold Little Ice Age. Uh, solar activity has increased into the modern thermal maximum as shown. Cosmic particle bombardment in the upper atmosphere of oxygen and nitrogen generates beryllium-10. This interesting proxy inversely reflects the increased solar signal over the last 600 years. Note that the solar signal is stronger and is climbing out of the Little Ice Age. Note these well-known ocean currents are today oscillating energy collection and storage drivers of our modern climate on regional scale. Many of them the names you will recognize. This global image of the oceanic currents, warm red and blue cold, show the truncation and redirection of equatorial currents and their deflection spin-offs, the Gulf and the Japanese currents. The strong Antarctic Southern Polar Current is still there and very strong and very dominant. It's not very easy to see on this representation but it doesn't necessarily reflect or react to the global variations of the North, even today. Once um, one of the more favorable um, and, and the bigger influential uh, current systems is El Nino, E-N-S-O. Because it is on a large uninterrupted Pacific equatorial span, it can still accumulate some significant solar heating and energy which pulses back and forth between El Nino and La Nina. They alternate and they control rainfall and temperature. This is the rainfall shown here. And those regimes are significantly a part of the Pacific world. 
wet becomes dry and then changes back again. As the cycle alternates in this largest remaining equatorial heat increment engine. These current systems are what modify our weather climate variations around the pole Pacific. Rapid changes are evident in what you see in front of you here. 10 or more years elapse between the pulses, hot or cold, wet or dry. This is the Arctic polar vortex in purple, the deep winter cold temperatures covering North America. This cold high pressure system sitting over the pole and creeping south is kept in check by the surrounding moderating oceanic influences. And then there's the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, which is driven by cold dense waters from the pole and from the warmer Gulf Stream waters of the south. This pulsation is looking fairly predictable over the 1860 to 2010 period. It has a regular pattern of heating and cooling. This wonderful, beautiful NASA imagery from Null School is of the Gulf Stream current. The waters which are currently bathing you folks in Ireland and giving you some warmer weather. This is in stark contrast to the first slide of our deck today, which showed the massive ice sheets just 20,000 years ago. Which would Ireland prefer? The latest glacial maximum or your Gulf Stream spa? So what have we discovered from this brief glimpse at paleoclimatology? Climate change science very badly needs to involve factual information generated from the earth sciences millions of years ago and today. Theory must be consistent with millions of years of evidence from real data. It is not. Earth temperature is not controlled by or directly related to CO2 concentrations over 180 to 200 parts per million. Oceanic energy accumulation, storage and movement has created unique climates throughout Earth history. These climates require specific continental positions. Only by duplicating these conditions could we ever hope to recreate any similar temperatures. Humans have been lucky to live in the Holocene, a small island of warmth in time, dominated by glaciations on a falling temperature of the Earth. In the Holocene, there is nothing unusual about our rate of warming currently. Our message is embrace the warm, the humid, the CO2 fertilized times now but prepare for more glacial, glacial periods, cold periods ahead. Man's activities are not causing a climate emergency, but we will need to adapt to naturally occurring climate changes. Enjoy the warmth while we have it. Here are the links to that series of three YouTube videos that we have produced earlier that will fill in some of the gaps and expound on some of the ideas here. But there are a lot of other related subjects as well. Warning, uh, they are a little bit long-winded. You might uh, go to sleep to some of them. 